My name's Andrea Grotman. I'm a child neurologist and a clinical and biochemical geneticist from Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. And I obviously work with mitochondrial patients as well as other um, neurogenetic conditions. So I've been asked to talk about the brain, how the brain works, and kind of demystify some of the symptoms. And so I try to approach it based on the anatomy, like talk about brain-specific problems and then muscle-specific problems. I don't think I'll need the whole time, so I'll have some time for any questions at the end. I guess, okay. So, you know, when we talk about the brain, so the, the brain is not just the only thing that's part of the nervous system. And we talk about there's a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. And so what is the function of the nervous system in general? And so it basically will control all of your motor, your sensory, and autonomic functions. So those are the functions that your body does without you having to think about it, like breathing, your heart rate, respirations, and things like that. And so because I'm a neurologist, I like to think of things in terms of the anatomy. So you might hear somebody say, the patient has a central nervous system problem. What does that mean? So the brain and the spinal cord comprise the central nervous system. Whereas someone has a peripheral problem that encompasses your cranial nerves, right? So those are the nerves that move your eyes, your face, your mouth, and swallowing, as well as the autonomic nervous system. Just think of that as more of your fight or flight, right? Your heart rate, your blood pressure, Things that make you nervous may increase your heart rate and your blood pressure. When you're calm uh, or when you're sleeping, things slow down. So there's actually nerves that control that. Your muscles, other nerves to muscles and organs, right? So there are nerves that control um, peristalsis or movement of food through your GI tract. That's also controlled by, by um, nerves and there's muscle in there. There's smooth muscles. So, that, so those nerves are part of the nervous system. And then the junction between nerve and muscle. So that's called the neuromuscular junction. So basically, the nerves have to give a signal to your muscle to contract. So if you have weakness, the problem can be because your muscle doesn't work, your nerve doesn't give the signal, or that connection between the two is the problem. OK, so what makes up the brain? So the brain is comprised of functional units. We have. Now I gotta try to do all of this, okay. <laughs> I don't think there's a, no, the pointer doesn't work. No, I'll use the mouse, okay. So there is um, the neuron itself, and in the center is something called the nucleus. And then there's this long fiber, and then at the end, you see it almost looks like tree branches, right? So this is called the axon. And the axon is very specialized extension of the neuron, and it's covered by these fatty little packets that are called myelin, right? And so if you think of a wire in one of your electrical devices, think of those colored wires, the red, the green, the yellow. If you were to strip off that, there's a copper wire underneath, right? And so the purpose of the wire is to conduct electricity, and the reason why you need that colored plastic on top is because it keeps the electricity in that wire and makes it conduct faster. Otherwise, if you strip the wire off of your, um, your plug for your laptop, your laptop would probably work very slowly. The same thing in the brain. So we have this myelin because it keeps all the electrical charges of the brain inside and helps the charges go quickly because one brain cell has to talk to the other, has to talk to the other, or has to talk to a muscle. And so there are some people who have problems with their myelin. They may have a demyelinating disorder or a problem where the myelin didn't develop correctly. And so therefore, the signal is slow to get from one brain cell to the next or to get from a brain cell to a muscle. And then that can cause neurologic symptoms as well because there's a problem in that information passing. So the brain uses two ways to communicate with other brain cells or muscles. It uses electricity and it also uses chemicals. And so at the end of the, of the neuron, we have these little branches. And you can't really appreciate it on this picture, but at the end of these branches might be little enlargements called boutons where packets of chemicals can be released as the electrical signal comes down and quickly 
through the axon to the end, and it causes the release of these chemical signals that travel across a little space. And then depending on where you are in the nervous system, if you're in the central nervous system, those signals may go to another neuron and cause that one to fire as well. And then you have a circuit where they, these may be in the neuromuscular junction. There may be a muscle here, and those little packets of chemicals go to the muscle and make your muscle contract, right? So this is all stuff you don't think about. You don't say, okay, muscle contract. So this all happens really quickly when it's working. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna switch to the muscle. So the same situation, you have a neuron, you have the axon which passes the signals, but instead of another neuron being here, you have a muscle fiber. And so the, oops, it's very sensitive. So the area where the end of the neuron connects with the muscle is called the neuromuscular junction. And so that's where some chemicals are released and there are receptors on the muscle that take up that chemical, they cause some changes, they may open some channels, and then the muscle contracts. So if you have a muscle problem, the problem can be in the muscle itself. Maybe you don't have enough fibers, the fibers are damaged, maybe it was a developmental problem where the muscles didn't develop properly, or you could have a problem in the neuromuscular junction, there's not enough of the chemical released, or there's a problem with uptaking the chemical into the muscle, or you have a problem with the myelin, or you have a problem in the neuron. So it can be anywhere along that track. Okay, so what symptoms come from the brain and spinal cord? So I showed you the working unit of the, ner of the central nervous system, the neurons, and I showed you the working unit of the peripheral nervous system, so the muscle nerve neuromuscular junction. So, what can, so if you have a problem in the central nervous system or in the brain, what problems can you have? So you can have seizures, right? So seizures are abnormal electrical activity. So the activity from one neuron to the next is not working properly. So instead of having a well-coordinated system where signals pass from one neuron to the next, and maybe that underlies speech or some you know, cognitive function, there's a misfiring or miswiring, and you get a seizure. Low tone. So tone is not the same as weakness. Tone is basically being able to support your muscles against gravity. Your tone can be too low or too high, right? So low tone is hypotonia. When your tone is too high, it's hypertonia. You're stiff, you're rigid, you're spastic. Um, so tone comes from the brain down. Your thinking concentration or memory problems may come from problems in the brain because the neurons aren't talking to one another. Maybe there's been a stroke in that area. So there's no um, connection between that part of the brain with other critical areas because those pathways have been lost. Those neurons have been um, destroyed. Speech, so ability to form your words and to be able to move your muscles to make speech sounds comes from the brain. And then we talked about spasticity. So here's an example of a floppy baby, right? If you hold the baby, he or she just kind of flops and drapes right over your arm, doesn't really hold itself up. On the other extreme, here's the result of too much tone, right? So fisting and um, contractures, right? So if a muscle isn't moved across a joint, it can lead to a contracture. So if you have too much tone, it may be difficult to move that muscle. So that's why it's important, and that's why we recommend physical therapy and stretching and bracing and to maintain that motion across the joint because once you lose that, you don't have the ability to perform the function of that joint. Um, your brain is very complex for critical, critical thinking, problem solving, reasoning, and evaluation. And then, of course, seizures for anyone who's familiar with an EEG. So what does an EEG measure? It's basically looking at the electrical activity in the brain. And depending on your age and whether you're awake or asleep, there should be a certain amount of these little um, bumps that occur per minute of the EEG. So if you're a young person or a baby, things tend to be a little bit slower, um, as well as if you're an elderly person, things kind of slow down. But if you're a young child or a school-aged child, a young adult, things are a little bit faster. And so the EEG looks at 
the baseline activity, are the waves too fast, too slow? Sometimes medications can affect the waves that you see. Some medications may actually slow down your EEG, like sedatives, and some may actually make it faster. Then you look to see, are there any of those little bumps and waves that are suggestive of seizures or risk for seizures? And so it really takes a skill and a training for a neurologist to look at an EEG and to be able to tell that information. And then we also have to know, is the patient awake or asleep? Because the EEG looks very different in someone who's sleeping than someone's awake. Okay. Now what problems come from the muscle unit? So muscle weakness, right? So that can be in the proximal muscle. So proximal means the muscles closest to your trunk. So the trunk, we talk about the trunk as being like from the neck to the like bottom of the hips, right? So these are your truncal muscles or your core muscles, right? Your stomach, your abdomen. And then we talk about the extremities or the um, appendicular muscles or your arms and your legs. Then we talk about proximal and distal, right? So certain types of muscle disorders only affect the proximal. So if you have difficulty reaching above your head or combing your hair or getting something out of a cabinet or your proximal muscles in the lower extremities, you may have trouble getting up from a chair, right? Because you need your hip flexors and your glutes or your butt muscles. Whereas distal muscles are more like your fingers, right? So being able to, you know, have fine motor control or in your feet, right? Maybe you can't um, walk on your toes, for example, because you have weakness there. So a neurologist will tend to see the pattern of muscle weakness because that's suggestive of what the cause may be or the category of disease. And then don't forget that your face has many, many muscles, your face and your eyes, right? So people who have muscle weakness in their face, they may look like they're angry because they can't really smile, right? They may kind of grimace, or they may have droopy lids because their muscles in their eyes can't hold their eyelids up, or they can't move their eyes from side to side. So that's like what we would see in CPEO, right? Chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. So ophtho means eyes, plegia means like a paralysis, so they can't move the, their eyes because of the eye muscles. Ptosis is the droopy lid, so that's when the, the eyelid droops down, and usually it has to be covering at least a third of the pupil, which is the black little circle in your eye, to be considered a neurologic ptosis. Some people have like a one-sided or a unilateral ptosis at birth that is not like necessarily a neuromuscular disorder. They're just kind of born with that. But when we're talking about mitochondrial disorders, it's usually bilateral, symmetric, and it has to cover at least a third of the pupil. And it can be with fatigue, right? Some people may, their eyes may be open, and then if you look at them at the end of the day, their eyes are droopy. What we do as neurologists, and you might have had this during your exam, is we'll often have the patient look up for a bit. What are we doing? We're trying to fatigue that muscle, right? And the other thing is we may have the patient stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, because depending on the time of day you come for your appointment, we may or may not see the symptoms that you're manifesting, right? And someone talked about that with the six minute walk test being good in the morning, but not in the afternoon, or someone with PT not being able to participate fully in the afternoon because they're too weak. So I think in order to appreciate the extent of muscle weakness, you really have to do tests to try to fatigue the muscle, right? Because we see you any time of day, and we may be seeing you at your best or your worst, but we need to know what the extremes of your function are. So I always have my patients, if they're adults, I usually have them get up from a chair. If they're kids and they're able to get on the floor, I don't have the adults get off the floor, get off on the floor and then try to stand up and that will give me a sense of what their muscle strength is and I may have them do it three or four times and you know sometimes I'll see a patient they're fine they pop up they pop up a little bit harder a little bit harder now they're leaning right so that tells me that they have muscle weakness that's fatigable so that they have some strength but the more they go through their day, they're more likely experiencing fatigue by the end of the day. So that helps me in my decisions about treatments and, and whatnot. Okay. And then the myopathic face. 
So that's a face that basically has no expression. It just looks really flat because the muscles are not activating and it's just like, you know, they don't smile well and the face just looks kind of dull. They look asleep. Okay. So other things that can happen in our great brain is we can have a stroke. And there are different names for strokes. Um, cardiovascular accident or cerebrovascular accident. Um, and basically, what is a stroke? So it's a damage to the brain because there's an interruption of the blood supply. It's a medical emergency. It's a 911 brain attack. Um, the symptoms of stroke really depend on where the stroke is. So you can have trouble walking. You can have trouble speaking. You can have trouble understanding, right? So some people may look completely fine. They don't have a paralysis, but they can't respond to questions. They don't understand because the stroke is in the part of their brain that, where they have comprehension of language. Um, or you could have paralysis or numbness of a face, arm, and leg on the same side. Now, that's a little bit different from a metabolic stroke that we see in mitochondrial disease because there's not necessarily a disruption of the blood supply. It's kind of like an energy shutdown, right? So the brain's run out of energy. It's run out of ATP, which is the gasoline in our body and it shuts down. It can also have a rapid onset. So sometimes differentiating whether it's a metabolic stroke from a vascular stroke, especially in an adult, can be difficult. Now, kids aren't supposed to have strokes, but sometimes kids have vascular strokes, right? So, um, so, so sometimes it's hard, and we need to act quickly because either type of stroke, a vascular stroke or a metabolic stroke, is a medical emergency. Um, and so, there can be decompensation from an underlying metabolic disorder that leads to the stroke. Certain things may be risk factors like dehydration, illness, um, a seizure. So in MILAS, for example, patients may start off having a seizure, and then all of a sudden, when the seizure stops, there's a, a deficit. They're not moving an arm, they're not moving a leg, the face looks flat on one side. So stroke is an emergency. Okay. So the metabolic strokes, um, usually start with a metabolic dysfunction, and then there's a rapid onset of a brain lesion. Um, sometimes we don't understand how a metabolic stroke occurs, um, but it usually represents a shutdown of the system or a decompensation, and there may be an external stressor. So like I talked about, an illness, or maybe a patient is fasting, right? So maybe they've been without food, either because they're sick or they're being prepared for a surgical procedure. So it's really important if you have a surgical procedure coming up to tell your metabolic doctor, even if it's just a tooth extraction and they want you to not eat anything after midnight, right? Even though the procedure itself may be quite benign and quick, the preparation for the procedure could put you at risk for a metabolic stroke. So you really have to share all of your medical information with your metabolic doctors. Fasting. Um, is one. And then there are different types of metabolic strokes depending on the disorder. So here, the most common one that, that's relevant to us is the MILAS. Um, so that can be due to the common mutation or other mtDNA mutations. And many places will give you arginine um, and potentially taurine as a preventative. So arginine both for acute stroke if you come in with a certain time window, usually three hours, and to prevent future strokes. So you may get IV arginine on arrival, and then you may be on oral arginine just as your maintenance, and or citrulline or taurine. Lay syndrome, um, there are about 75 different genes that can contribute to Lay syndrome. Um, supportive care, we don't tend to give arginine to kids with Lay syndrome. Um, Paul G, um, sometimes those, those patients can have strokes and may require arginine. And then there are a bunch of other disorders that I'm not going to talk about because they're not mito, but there are other metabolic disorders that can cause strokes, such as Fabry's disease, propionic acido acidemia, um, congenital disorders of glycosylation, glutaric aciduria, homocystinuria, other metabolic disorders that are associated with decompensation and stroke. You know, so sometimes your doctor needs to rule out those other disorders as well. Right? Because just having the stroke, if you don't have a diagnosis, this may be the first, the first medical indication of a mitochondrial disease of MILAS. You may 
child may be perfectly fine and then present with seizures or stroke. They have to rule out everything because the treatments are completely different. Okay. So let's talk more about stroke and MILAS since this is the mitochondrial um, meeting. So MILAS stands for metabolic encephalopathy. So the term encephalopathy just refers to a brain that's not working, right? It doesn't tell you the cause of why the brain's not working. You can have an encephalopathy. You can have an epileptic encephalopathy. You have a lot of seizures, and over time, cognitive stills don't develop. Um, so, the, so the term encephalopathy is very general and not precise to the underlying etiology. It also encompasses lactic acidosis, right? Your lactate levels are elevated. And stroke-like episodes, right? So we say stroke-like episodes because Sometimes it doesn't go to a completed stroke, um, and because also they're not the type of strokes that we see in people who have a clogged artery. They're that metabolic stroke, shutdown of the system, you run out of energy type of stroke. Um, that's the prototypical type of stroke that we see in Milas syndrome. About 80% of the time, we have the variant in the A3243 A to G, but the remainder of the genes are other variants in that same gene or other um, mitochondrial genes. And then the mechanism is reversed from the typical arterial stroke. So instead of having poor blood flow causing from a clot causing the brain injury, we have stressed out system, increased metabolic demands, maybe from a, a febrile illness you have a fever, and then localized swelling secondary to restricted blood flow leading to further injury. The stroke-like episodes seen in MILAS don't typically conform to a vascular territory. So when the radiologist looks at the MRI, there's a very clear picture you see like in an adult who's had a stroke. There's the area of the brain around where a major vessel is, is the area that is affected by the stroke. We don't see that in MILAS. We tend to see the lesions maybe more in the back or between where the vessel territories are. The seizures can occur in conjunction and may be difficult to control in MILAS. So patients with MILAS have, may have to be on one, two, three, four, multiple anti-seizure medications, either singly or in combination. And then as the increased blood flow and electrical activity escalate metabolic demands, you can actually extend the stroke area and the epileptic area, and that can spread and persist. So a patient can be recovering from a stroke from MILAS and look fine, and then like three days later start having seizures because of that metabolic resolution. In distinction, we're gonna talk about the myopathy or the muscle problems. So these are abnormalities of the muscle structure, and metabolism can lead to various patterns of weakness, and I talked about proximal and distal, right? Um, and then some cases, the muscle can also involve heart muscle, right? So don't forget that your heart is one big muscle. It's um, the same type of muscle that you have in your, your skeletal muscle as well. So whenever a patient has a muscle problem, they should be checked to make sure that they don't have a problem with their heart muscle because sometimes you can see the two together. Um, so myopathies can be inherited or acquired. The time course, the pattern of muscle weakness, and the absence or presence of family history can help to distinguish between the two types. If you have an early onset of muscle problems with longer duration of disease, or if you have a sudden acute presentation, then later age is more consistent with an acquired myopathy. So in any case, the earlier the neurologic symptoms, usually the more severe the clinical um, syndrome is gonna be, okay? So what is a mitochondrial myopathy? and why do we care about it? So again, the patient may manifest with weakness. We talked about it being at baseline or can be fatigable, right? So that's why it's important to stress the muscles the best we can in the office by doing repetitive activities. There are certain types of findings that we might see in a muscle if we do a biopsy. So people have talked about these ragged red fibers that we see in certain types of mitochondrial myopathies. Those are signatures of abnormal mitochondria accumulating in the muscle. Um, there are various disorders that have muscle weakness associated with them. So um, MRF, which is myoclonic epilepsy, so they can have epilepsy and these ragged red fibers. So you don't have to have one or the other. You can have a central nervous system problem and a peripheral nervous system problem together in the same patient. So you can have seizures and a muscle problem. You can have a stroke and muscle problems. 
you can have um, GI problems, because GI is smooth muscle, as well as skeletal muscle, so meningi. And then you can have muscles only in the eyes that are involved, so that's your CPEO or PEO. So just the muscles that control eye movement are involved, but your skeletal muscle may or may not be involved, at least initially. Okay, so we also talked about the nerve being important because the nerve or the neuron sends information to the muscle telling it to fire. So maybe the problem with weakness isn't in the muscle and it's in the nerve. So we do have a group of disorders that result from either damage or malfunctioning of nerves, and that usually causes weakness. The weakness is typically distal, right? So a muscle problem is usually those proximal, the ones close to your trunk, your shoulders, your upper arm, you just can't reach them for part, or the ones in your butt, in your thighs, you have trouble standing up. But if you have a nerve problem, in addition to weakness in the extremities, fingers and toes, you may get some pins and needles right, that's known as neuropathy, um, numbness. So numbness is the absence of sensation. So you don't feel anything. And you look at your foot and you're like, mm, how do I get that sore? You stepped on something, you didn't feel it because you have lack of sensation. So, okay, so that would be numbness. And then you may have increased sensation. So pins and needles are burning. So that, that would also be consistent with a neuropathy. Um, and so over time, you can, the neuropathy can spread you can have decreased vibration sense. Um, and so why is it important to know about and treat neuropathies? Because that's how our body tells us where we are in space. We rely on our muscles, we rely on our vision, we rely on our inner ears, and we rely on our nerves. So if the lights are shut out and we don't have visual input and we're walking around, you know, we may bump into things because we don't know where our feet are in space. If we have a severe neuropathy, you may fall down. You may injure yourself. So think of diabetics who have numbness. They often will get ulcers or lesions because they or burn their feet because they don't feel that the water's hot. So neuropathy can be just as significant as a muscle problem as well. And over time, you can also get contractures. So you could get loss of function of those muscles because the nerves actually give nutritional information to the muscles. So you can get contractures in your fingers or in your toes. So bracing is also important for some types of neuropathies as well as for muscle weakness. Okay. So various causes of neuropathies. And again, some of these can, you could have more than one. So you could have diabetes and a vitamin deficiency, like a B12 deficiency, because maybe you have problems absorbing BI, B12 because you have a, a gastrointestinal problem. Autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis. Maybe you've had an injury to your nerves. Different types of infections that seem to target just the nerve. Herpes, neuralgia can cause like shingles and that goes to your nerves. Genetic disorders, so like Friedrich's ataxia or other mitochondrial disorders. Amyloid tumors that are close to the nerve. Um, so it's really important to have that investigated because some of them are treatable. So a vitamin deficiency is treatable. If you have a B12 deficiency, you might have burning in your fingers and toes, but that could be treatable by your diet. The same with diabetes, managing your blood sugar, whereas others may not be treatable. And then there are certain medications or drugs that may also damage your nerves. Certain chemotherapy drugs can cause neuropathies as well. So it's always important to figure out what the cause of the neuropathy is, exclude treatable conditions to the extent that you're able to restore function. Okay. Now what about neuropathy and mitochondrial disorders? So that often occurs in certain mitochondrial disorders. Um, and so the two types most commonly are those that have, um, that affect maintenance and replication or defects in the respiratory chain like complex five. So that would be something like NARP, and also mutations and in proteins involved in mitochondrial dynamics, so fission and fusion of mitochondria. And so the, there is a distribution of mitochondria along your peripheral axons, and that's regulated by this fission and fusion. And so often people will complain of a burning sensation, right? So it just feels like their feet or their fingers are on fire. And neuropathies are usually distal, so they typically tend to start in your feet. And then usually by the time they get up to the knee is when you start developing them in your fingers. Okay. 
Now, just back to seizures again. I kind of alluded to it briefly, but a seizure is a sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance of the brain. So it can cause changes in your behavior, your movements, your feelings, and in your level of consciousness, right? So not all seizures are like the kind you see on TV where the patient is shaking both extremities. Some seizures can just be staring off. You're talking to somebody, all of a sudden, they're not there, they're not focused, they're not responding, you're like tapping them, nothing. That can be a focal seizure. Um, they can also have a loss of tone and fall down, have an atonic seizure. So there are many different types of seizures. Um, it can just be on one side. It can start on one side and spread. Um, it can be both sides are generalized at onset. And if you have two or more seizures, at least 24 hours apart, that don't have an identifiable trigger, then that's referred to as epilepsy, right? So you are an epileptic if you've had two or more what we call unprovoked seizures. So provoked seizures would be you have a fever, you're sick, you had a medication that caused a seizure, um, but an unprovoked seizure, two of them separated by at least 24 hours, you now have the diagnosis of epilepsy. You're an epileptic. So what do you do if someone has a seizure? First of all, you wanna stay calm. You don't wanna put anything in their mouth. They're not going to swallow their tongue, it's attached. You actually could make things worse by you know, occluding their airway. So you don't wanna to touch their mouth at all. If they're standing up, or seated, you wanna slowly get them to the floor. Um, you basically wanna put them in a place where they can't hurt themselves. You wanna stay with them while they're having the seizure. Um, you might wanna turn them on their side in case they vomit. Some people will vomit after a seizure. If they're lying down, they could actually aspirate their own vomitus, so you wanna put them in a safe spot. You definitely wanna call 911. If the patient has a known seizure disorder or has epilepsy, you may have a rescue medication that your neurologist has prescribed with instructions specific for your seizure. For example, you know some people have rescue medication for seizures lasting more than five minutes. So the reason why we use five minutes is most seizures are self-limited and will stop in a couple minutes. If a seizure is going on for five minutes, it's likely not going to stop on its own and you need some medication intervention. Or having a, clusters of seizures, again, it varies for the patient. Sometimes we say more than three or four in an hour. The same thing, the more you have, the less likely it's gonna stop on its own and you need medication. You should still call your neurologist or your, whoever your care provider is and 911, um, even after you've given the seizure medicine because these are short duration, so they have a quick onset but they also have a quick offset. These rescue meds like the rectal Valium or midazolam or other medications like that, they act quickly, but they wear off fast. So the patient could still have seizures after the medication wears off. So they still need to be evaluated by, or given instructions by their provider. And then when it's over, you know, just again, keep, keep calm. Um, if the person is woken up, you know, ask them how they feel. Some patients will have what we call an aura, which is a sensation that they're gonna have a seizure. And not everybody has one, but those who have had it have described it as either just feeling not well, um, something that they can't pinpoint, but they just feel like this ominous feeling that something bad's gonna happen. They may have a stomach ache or they may get a headache or a feeling of fright. Okay, so there are any different types of seizures that can range in the symptoms and severity, and they vary by where they are in the brain, where they begin, and when they spread to. Now, most seizures are brief, like 30 seconds to two minutes, but again, those that last longer than five minutes could be a medical emergency. You could have temporary confusion, a staring spell, uncontrollable jerking movements of the arms and legs, loss of consciousness or awareness, and some patients have more kind of sensory type seizures where they just have fear, they have anxiety or deja vu type of um, sensation. And so again, the neurons in the brain create, send and receive electrical impulses which allow the nerve cells to communicate and anything that disrupts that communication pathway can lead to a seizures. Some types of seizures may be caused by other genetic mutations in addition to mitochondrial, and they may run in families. So it's really important if you know that someone in your family had seizures to mention it to your doctor because they'll be able to draw out your family tree and see you know, who the people are and how they're related to you or your child and 
get a sense of whether they need to look for other causes for the seizures or it's just from the mitochondrial disorder. Okay, so sometimes seizures can be triggered by different things. Not everybody has a trigger, but in general, we generally advise people to get enough sleep because lack of sleep can actually trigger seizures. And that leads to an important point in the EEG, especially in children, most of the seizures come out of the sleep state. So sleep is actually a developmental milestone, if you will, of the brain. So we're not all born with normal sleep cycles. That's why infants don't sleep through the night, because their brains are not wired for them to sleep through the night. It's as their brain matures and those pathways mature that they're able to consolidate sleep. So sleep is a very disrupted neurologic entity. And so in children, at least, many seizures come, come in sleep state. So it's very important if you're suspecting a seizure in a child that the EEG have portions where the child's awake, but more importantly, portions where the child is asleep. So you can't say 100% that it's a normal EEG if you don't have any sleep report recorded on it. And sometimes that means bringing a patient in overnight to do an overnight EEG, right? Because if they don't fall asleep during the 30 minute EEG or the two hour EEG that you do in the daytime, you really need to get that sleep. So sleep, can, you know, you can start to see the, the um, features of epilepsy in the sleep EEG. So lack of sleep can actually be um, a trigger. So sometimes patients come in the hospital and we don't know if they're having seizures or we want to um, try to capture a seizure to determine treatment, we may sleep deprive them, that's why. Flashing lights, moving patterns or other visual stimuli may be triggers for both migraines and seizures. Low blood sugar, low blood salt. Um, people are on diuretics or don't eat a lot of salt in their body sometimes can have a seizure if their blood salt drops too low. Certain medications, um, antidepressants can increase your risk of seizures. Head trauma, where you have bleeding in the brain, um, abnormal blood vessels, autoimmune disorders, MS, lupus, strokes, a brain tumor, um, recreational drugs, so cocaine and amphetamines, alcohol misuse alcohol withdrawal or extreme intoxication. And now we've realized that COVID-19 infections can present with seizures or can cause seizures after the recovery. Pretty much COVID can cause anything. So again, <laughs> um, confusion and aura, sudden falls, strange sensations or emotions. Some people may report an abnormal smell and jerking movements, okay. Um, so moving on to kind of more specialized functions of the brain. Um, speech and language deficits also can occur because of abnormalities in the brain. So speech is how we say the sounds and words. So people with speech problems may not say sounds clearly. They may have a hoarse or raspy voice. They may repeat sounds or pause, like stutter. Um, so that's different from language. So language is the words we use to share ideas and get our, our thought across. And a person with a language disorder may have problems understanding, talking, reading, or writing, right? So they may be able to speak properly, but they don't understand what other people are saying, or they can't read. Movement disorders. So what are movement disorders? Um, so these are a group of disorders that, you, that cause abnormal increased or decreased movements, I should say, that may be voluntary or non-voluntary. So movement disorders are described by different categories. So ataxia um, is a movement disorder usually due to the back of the brain, the cerebellum, that controls coordinated movement and balance. So patients with ataxia may walk with a very wide gait, right? They can't keep their feet together and they may sway. They may sway back and forth. And if you ask them to put their feet together and close their eyes, they may fall from side to side. So that's why your neurologist may ask you all right, put your feet together, close your eyes, and kind of give you a little push. They also, it can affect your coordination. So if you go to reach for something, you may have a tremor, right? I think somebody, there was a lecture for the docs on movement disorders where they have a tremor. And the tremor is usually as you're approaching your target, as you're stretching, or as you're bringing it back, right? So that can be ataxia. Um, chorea are kind of like these irregular um, almost dance-like movements. 
Now, you can have more than one movement disorder. You're not restricted to have one from each from the category, and that's it. So some people have ataxia and chorea. Um, dystonia is a sustained posture. There's usually a twisting, and it may be invoked by movement or excitement. So the person may be fine, and then you know they go to reach for something, and there's this twisting of the muscle, and it stays in that position for a long time. Sometimes people confuse dystonia with spasticity, right? Because you're rigid. But antispasticity meds don't often work for dystonia. So it's important for people to actually feel the tone and to see what initiates the, the um, abnormal posture. And so dystonia can be generalized, or it can affect just a part of the body, like a focal dystonia. You could just have it in your neck. And sometimes people with dystonia have what they call these sensory tricks to try to hide the fact that they have it. So they may, you know, do something like this, or, you know, just to kind of hide the fact that they have an abnormal posture. Okay, so, <laughs> so that's why we do the neurologic exam. So we're looking at, and I didn't talk about reflexes, but we're looking at sensation. So that's why they may stick you with something sharp, something dull to see if you're feeling it. They want to see how your nerves are working. The tuning fork, again, vibration is a sense that your nerves are processing. Usually vibration is the first modality of sensation to be damaged. So um, if you don't feel the tuning fork down in your toe, but you feel it at your knee, you may have the signs of a neuropathy. Even if you still feel the sharp pin or the dull brush that they use. Um, so the coordination, that's doing the finger nose, right? And sometimes the heel shin is looking for those tremors as you approach the targets to see if your cerebellum is working. The reflexes is when they tap your knee and you give that little kick. If you kick too much, that can be a sign that you're spastic. So they know that that's coming from the brain as opposed to a muscle problem. If you don't have any reflexes, you could either have a muscle problem or you could have a neuropathy. So it helps us localize where the lesion is. And then watching people walk is very important. So let's see if I can imitate some of these gait patterns. So, I don't know, I probably have to come down here, right? Okay. So we talked about ataxia with a wide gait and kind of swaying from side to side. Um, a spastic gait, you may be up on your leg, right? Or you may circumduct like this, and usually the arm is held fisted on the same side. Um, an antalgic gait, so when it hurts, people don't want to really put their foot down, so they're very cautious, right? And also, if you have ataxia, you're not able to do this. I'm not that great at it either, but I think that's because I'm old. <laughs> um, the heel to shin, because so midline. Um, so those would be the major gait patterns that we'd be looking for on the exam. And then muscle strength. So you know you want to kind of try to push the muscle down against gravity, make a fist, you know, squeeze my finger type of thing. It's hard for me to do my own muscle exam. Um, so, so that's why we do all those things. And should do it from head to toe, comparing side to side. Because we're always looking for symmetries and asymmetries. Because sometimes things are subtle. So it's possible that somebody with Milas had a stroke, but it didn't reach clinical severity that they needed to be admitted. And the only way we may know is we see them and follow up in clinic. And we're like, hmm, were they weak last time? Did they have a facial asymmetry last time? Let me look in my notes. Hmm, no, the face I wrote, the face was symmetric. Maybe they had an event. You get the MRI and you see a new stroke. So not every stroke is a major 911 type of stroke. So so it's really important for people to document the symptoms, the neurologic exam, so you can compare if there are any new symptoms that come up the next time. Okay. Okay. So here's here's some stuff we do. So here's the tuning fork right here, um, the neurologic exam. So here's somebody trying to assess strength in the lower extremities, the reflexes, and the eye movements. Right. So we have you look look here without turning your head. Look here. So we want to make sure that the eyes move smoothly. Look up, look down, and then again, testing for ptosis. Look up at my finger. You know, look up for a while, and then we look at the lids. Are the, you know, we might do it a couple of times or do it for a long time and see the lids droop, right? Because we're trying to fatigue it. 
And then we have to gauge our neurologic exam, keeping in mind the developmental age of a child, because obviously there are some children that don't walk, so how do we assess motor? So again, you know, we have to see what kids are supposed to do at certain times. Those are known as milestones. There are motor milestones. There are language motor milestones. And so if you have a small child, your doctor should be asking you, you know, does your child, what age when your child walked or when they rolled, and then did they lose any skills? So that's how we know if, there's, if they're keeping up with their milestones, if they have delays, if motor function is delayed, et cetera, or if there's been a loss of function. And then we have a number of tests. So if we have a clinical suspicion that something's not quite right, we have some tests we can do. So we have an MRI scanner here. Some of you might have had one. Um, so we can look at pretty much any part of the body by MRI. Um, brain and spine, we can also look, do muscle MRIs on occasion if we need to. Um, and then EEG, so this is when we attach the wires to your child or your head. And then we can do muscle and nerve tests as well to tell us about the function of the um, part of the body that we're concerned about that's not working right. 